Hi, everyone. My name is Simon. And if you're here to learn how C++ debuggers work, then you're in the right room. Before I get started, at Microsoft, we do have a survey, which would be great if you can complete, and you can win an Xbox One. Woo. That's half-hearted, but I'll let you away with it. OK, so this is a bit about my background in debuggers, so you know that I actually kind of understand vaguely what I'm talking about. So I used to work for a great company in Edinburgh called Codeplay, literally until this week. Um, and there I worked a lot on debuggers. So I worked on a debugger for HSA, um, which is like a low level um, standard for um, heterogeneous systems. We have GPUs and DSPs and tiny image processors, whatever. Um, I also worked a lot with OpenCL debuggers, which is another kind of similar standard. Um, and I worked a lot with LLVM's debugger, LLDB. Uh, there are a few people um, at this conference who actually work on LLDB, so if you'd like to talk to them, come see me and I'll introduce you. So a bit about what I'm talking about here. Presumably we all have used a debugger at some point. Hands, everyone used debugger? That's the right number of hands. I'm in the right room. Does anyone know what this is? Grace Hopper, the bug, yes, this is the bug. Grace Hopper's bug. Grace Hopper's bug, yes, anyone know what machine it was from? No, I believe it was um, Harvard's uh, Mach 2 calculator. They found literally a moth. Our debuggers don't tend to look like this. If you're doing this, then come speak to me after, I want to hear about it. Our debuggers sometimes look like this which is LLDB running inside a terminal. Sometimes they look like this, which is GDB running inside Emacs. Yep, some people like that. Um, some people might use the LLDB um, curses interface, it's quite nice. Visual Studio Debugger. My definition is, I definitely did not steal this from Wikipedia, an application which is used to test and debug other applications. And the most common actions you will use with a debugger are breakpoints, saying I want to stop here, at this line of code, or I want to stop at this function. You could step around, could be just instructions, could be jumping over functions, jumping into functions. You might want to do expression evaluation. What is the value of x right now? Or you might want to say, how did I get here? What's my call stack? So these are the main things I'm going to talk about, and a little bit more towards the end as well. A bit of an introduction to the platform I'm going to talk about. So I will be focusing on Linux systems on x86-64 with ELF as a binary format. You don't need to know what that is yet. Similar for Dwarf, which is a debug format, and using ptrace as um, the main interface library. So most of the concepts which I will talk about are kind of transferable to other platforms and systems. Um, obviously, the function calls will change. You might be working at a different level of abstraction, but the kind of general concepts will, will apply. So this is a very nice um, look at what ELF is. Um, there is an even more detailed version of this, but it looks terrible on slides. So go to this, uh, whoops, sorry, um, Angel Bertini's website if you'd like to see uh, an even better introduction. But the basic idea is it's a binary format for executables and objects. So it consists of a header which tells you about what this executable is, you know, what machine am I um, compiled for, and then a bunch of code which is separated into, sec into sections. So you don't need to know a whole lot about, lot about ELF, but this is the kind of main format for Linux executables. So it's useful to learn a little bit about it if you want to actually work on, on debuggers. Dwarf. You know, it's a funny joke, elf, dwarf. You know, GNU people are hilarious. And dwarf mostly consists of dies. Not like this, 
They look like this. This is a dwarf information entry. And these are used to describe the entirety of your programs from compilation units, which is what we have here. It's like files with all the includes already in. Um, functions, variables, types, pretty much everything you can think of can be expressed some way in dwarf information. And this is a standard. You can go and you can download it. You can have a read. It's actually, for a, a programming standard, it's quite understandable. So I would recommend going and having a look if you're interested. But this is an example of a, a compilation unit die. So it tells you like, oh, I was compiled by Clang 3.9.1. Um, this is the file I was compiled for. I'm C++. You can get quite a lot of information about your programs just by looking at these. And this is what the debugger will be consuming when it's trying to understand everything about your program. Debuggers can do a lot of things without Dwarf just by looking at the ELF file, symbol tables, things like that. But for any like heavyweight debugging, you, oops, you need uh, the Dwarf information. Um, so as well as dies like this, there are, is line table information. So this tells you which lines of my source code correspond to which machine code addresses. So you'll see that these, uh, you have the addresses on the left hand side, and then you have rows and columns for your source code. And then over at the right hand side, there's some descriptions which are all in nice acronyms. So NS is new statement, um, prolog end, end text, the end of the program. So this is what the debugger is going to look at to try and understand how your source code relates to the machine code. Not only how like your C++, um, like your representation of your program maps to it, but also the literal text in the file. This is ptrace. ptrace is, well, it's ptrace. Everyone who's worked with debuggers at any time, if you say ptrace, their face will just drop. That's because this is ptrace. It's one function. You pass it a request, a process ID, and then an address and data. And depending on what this request is, maybe it ignores these other two. Maybe they mean something different. Maybe you just pass null pointer all the time. So a few things you can do is like say, I want my debugger to be allowed to trace me. Uh, I want to read and write memory. I want to read and write registers. And so you just pass these enums into this function and it will do wildly different things. So ptrace exists. It's mostly does its job. If you want to read more about it, there is a man page. Breakpoints. So breakpoints, I think, are, I mean, debuggers in general are quite, um, compared to something like compilers, people don't know a lot about how debuggers work. Compilers, there are tons of books, there are blog posts. Most people who kind of do a little bit of C++ will have some understanding of how a compiler works, right? You know, you get in text, you build an AST, um, maybe you have an interview rep representation and you get to machine code and there are a number of steps to get you there. But debuggers, breakpoints are like one of the most fundamental parts and people see it as black magic. This is some box where I say, oh holy oracle, please place a breakpoint at line 20 of this file and by some magic you get a breakpoint at that line in that file. But they're actually not so complicated. So there are two main kinds of breakpoints, hardware breakpoints and software breakpoints. Difference between these two is that hardware breakpoints we usually have some kind of special registers which you're gonna write values into and the hardware is gonna take control, make sure that when you actually hit those addresses that something happens, you get a breakpoint. Software breakpoints on the other hand, you actually take the code which you're executing in memory and you're gonna modify it so that a breakpoint gets set. And we'll see how these both work a little bit more. 
Hardware breakpoints are limited because you're, you're not using physical registers um, and you only have so many. Whereas uh, software breakpoints, because you're just dealing with memory, it's essentially unlimited, you know, apart from how much memory you actually have and whatnot. Um, the cool thing about hardware breakpoints is that you can set them to break on reading or writing or executing an address. Whereas software breakpoints are only on execution. So if you want to say, uh, debugger, I want to be notified every time this address is changed, which can be really useful if you're trying to track down some, um, some really weird bug. And you can only really do that with hardware breakpoints. Software breakpoints, just execution. So I'll talk briefly about hardware breakpoints and more gonna focus on software ones. So in x86, you have four um, debug registers, which you use to, you would write addresses into these, and then when you get to that address, the debugger will um, get notified by means we're gonna see in a little bit. Um, it has a register for, which you can read the status of and see like what's going on with, um, with all these uh, breakpoints I've set. And you have something which you can actually control to say I want to break on reading, writing, executing. So I won't go into much more detail about hardware breakpoints, especially because they're very hardware specific. Software breakpoints, on the other hand, tend to be implemented in very similar ways. So if you read a debugger, um, if you read the source code for a debugger, then when you get down to actually setting breakpoints, it's all very similar on ARM, on x86, um, and this is how it works. So say we have some assembly code. This is some x86 assembly. You don't have to understand what it's doing. Um, so on the right we have the assembly, on the left we have the actual um, hexadecimal representation of these instructions, okay? I want to set a breakpoint at this move instruction. So I tell my break, I, maybe I know the address of this and I'm explicitly telling my debugger, set a breakpoint right here. What the debugger then does so it takes this first byte, this OX48, and it's gonna set it off to the side, remember it for later. What it's then gonna do is replace the old value with this special OXCC. Now what this is, is um, the int3 instruction, and this is gonna trigger a software interrupt. So if our PC is sitting up at the top, our program counter, we go down, we stop, software interrupt. Basic idea is the operating system, if you don't know how interrupts work, um, the operating system's gonna register some interrupt handlers, and when an interrupt is triggered, then the handler for that interrupt will be invoked. So for int three, which is our R1 up here, then the operating system will put into place something which will be called for int3. And on Linux, this is the, the function which gets invoked eventually, do int3. So this is the actual code from the kernel. The most important part here is that in the middle of this, we have our do trap. And this sig trap thing is important. This is debugger magic. So if, if we look at the man pages for, for signals, sig trap is the trace and breakpoint trap. Now a Unix signal will get sent to our process and our debugger can then say, okay, we hit a breakpoint. And this is how the magic works. So I'll show an example of this all put together a bit. We start off, we have our debugger is awaiting input, sitting there, waiting for us to type continue or breakpoint or whatever. Our debuggy is stops, not doing anything. We have set a breakpoint at this second instruction here. Note the CC on the left hand side. So what's gonna do is the debugger is gonna wait for us to do something and we type in continue, say. So it's gonna continue the debuggy and then it's gonna wait on a signal. This is using wait PID which is a a Linux thing, but this is essentially just saying, okay, do nothing until I get a signal, and then I'm gonna wake up 
and I'm gonna do something about it. So we continued the debuggy, so this is now running. Forget about the debugger for a minute. We go down, we hit our int3, we stop. Software interrupt. We drop down into our interrupt handler, which issues a signal. Now, the debugger is woken up because it was waiting on a signal. Now we got one. I got a signal, yay. And now there are a bunch of other methods which we can um, use to say, okay, uh, where am I stopped? Where um, did the signal come from? Um, and we can report this in some way to the user. Does anyone want me to go over that again? Because that's all the magic of software breakpoints. Yes, the question was about if we have something like this continue debug E and then wait PID, like what happens if um, we have the pathological case where our thread scheduler, like, um, what's where it preempts us right after we call um, continue debuggy, the debuggy runs, um, and we haven't hit our wait PID and we miss a signal. Uh, I honestly cannot remember off the top of my head. I think it would be possible to miss signals with something like this unless you did um, extra synchronization, and I can't remember what kind of extra synchronization you would do. So I mean, there, there would be methods of doing this. Um, the overhead may or may not be worth it. Source level breakpoints. Oh, sorry, question. Um, what's stopping the debuggy from continuing? It's the, the operating system. So this P trace thing is a um, it's known by the operating system and um, interacts directly with the operating system. So when you um, when something is halted, it won't be scheduled. So the, the operating system will make sure it's not um, not going to run. What was the question, sir? Okay, good question. I um, didn't cover that, but I can go over it. So the question was, um, I talked about earlier when the, um, the debugger will save out the value um, that was previously in this CC. Um, and then the question was, how, when does it get restored back? Um, yep, and continue execution. So there are a few methods to do this. The most simple is to um, actually manipulate the program counter. So you go back over the instruction, you replace the um, OXCC with the original byte, you single step, and then you continue execution um, after you've replaced the breakpoint. Because you don't want the case where um, you, you continue, right? And maybe you have a loop and it should instantly hit the breakpoint. And that's actually not a, this happens a lot. So you want to, um, take the breakpoint off, put the old value in, single step, put the breakpoint back on, continue. That's the way that a lot of debuggers do it. Another possible way is actually having some memory put off to the side and um, relocating the, um, that instruction into that block, changing the program counter so that essentially um, will eventually jump back to the right point, and it means you don't have to like single step and replace the breakpoint. Um, I think G GDB calls it displaced stepping, so it's very useful for multi-threaded environments if you're um, like operating in a context where some threads are running and some threads are stopped. Does that answer the question? Okay. Yes. I just wanted to verify my understanding. So um, I don't know x86 assembly very well. Um, so if we have one of the interrupt handlers provided by the architecture and wouldn't install this function at the address of that uh, of N3 so that then the have instruction in just the handler that is registered by the operating system. That's correct, okay. yes. So the, the question was about the interrupt. And so the, the CC, I mean, most interrupt instructions are not just one byte. 
like an interrupt and something else. But int3 is special because it wants to be used for, for debugging, so there's a special one byte instruction for it. And Linux will um, register a handler um, in the interrupt vector table and descriptor table. I can never much remember which one's which. Um, and that is the, the do int. Um, so the, the bytes after int3, uh, after the OXCC, are not touched because when we eventually um, get rid of our breakpoint, put the OX48 back, then we want the instruction to still be as it was, so they're not touched. Um, yes? How does it do a single step? Well, we have slides on that. We'll see in a minute. Yes? What happens when you disable the breakpoint but not delete it? When you disable the breakpoint and not delete it, so one, um, one thing is debuggers can just swallow breakpoints. So they, they can just, like um, a breakpoint is hit, but the debugger just continues and doesn't tell you about it. So it could do that, or it could... Um, Yeah, so in, in the debugger, the question was uh, like data structure set aside to remember what's disabled and what's deleted. And yeah, so the debugger will have some data structures to say, okay, well, the user set this breakpoint um, and currently asked for it to be disabled, um, but may want to set it, enable it again later. So it will just remember the address and then maybe just remove the breakpoint or just swallow any ones which come up. There's another question, yes. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? I didn't quite understand the question. Yes, so, yeah, maybe this is a little bit um, misleading that I put the, I put the arrow, uh, oh, where did it go? Oh, I was supposed to have an arrow from the, the doint up, um, but it got lost somehow. But yeah, the, the doint will send a signal to the debuggy, and the, the wait PID is waiting for a signal on that process. Okay, that's the last question for now. I'll take more later. Source level breakpoints. Very simple example. We want to break on main. So what we do is we look up our dwarf information. We find a die with the right name. And we look at the low PC. This gives us an address. We can then set a breakpoint at this address. And it all works using what we just talked about. I mean, in reality, debuggers will like skip over the function prolog, things like that. But this is essentially what it's doing. So yeah, going from being able to set a breakpoint on a address to setting a breakpoint on a function like this is, I mean, you have to have a dwarf parser, but it's not a huge step. How about if we have an overloaded function? So most things I've talked about so far have applied pretty much to assembly or C, nothing C++ specific, but in C++ we can overload functions. So what happens if we want to set a breakpoint on just do thing double and not do thing string? So one thing, what's gonna be different about these two functions when they're compiled? Mangling, exactly. So do thing double will be mangled like so. Do thing string will be mangled like this. Because C++ is fantastic. So what we can do is look for something. If we want to set on just the double one, we can mangle the name and then just look for something with that linkage name, look at the low PC, rinse, repeat. Same as before. Yes, Victor. Yes, mangling can depend from compiler to compiler. So if you're doing, there are other methods to do this. I just picked a simple one. Um, but yeah, this would only work if you knew that you were working with the Itanium API. So if, you were, if you'd compiled something with um, MSVC mangling and you tried to do this 
mangled, your debugger mangled using Itanium ABI, then they would miss. Yeah, so on, on Linux, Itanium ABI for mangling is like de facto standard, essentially. How about lines? So if I want to set a breakpoint on foo.cpp line four. Then we talked about dies and we talked about line table information. So this is line table information. And we can see there is a line four over here. There's a few entries from line, for line four. Um, this could be because there are, it's like one line with multiple expressions which generate multiple um, assembly instructions. So we want to set one on the, the start of the statement. So if we look at this NS and set a breakpoint there. Have the address, it's the one on, on the left there. Again, going from instructions to source is just a case of looking at the dwarf and mapping it back. Stepping, here's the answer to your question. Um, so the main types of stepping you want to do are over just single assembly instructions, stepping over function calls, so you don't want to go inside a function um, if you call it. Stepping in is when you do want to go, and stepping out is when you want to like finish this function return out. So on x86 with sufficiently high kernel version number, you can just do this for instruction stepping. Uh, I will go into a bit more, the more complex things you might have to do, but ptrace has a, a single step um, enumerator, so you can just pass this and it'll do an instruction level single step. For stepping out, you can find the return address. I'll talk a little bit about that when I go into um, stack unwinding. But you can find the return address and you can set a breakpoint there. Now for stepping in, you can, you want to set a breakpoint at the return address in case you know, you're not actually stepping into a function, actually you're returning out. You don't want to just like continue off into cyberspace and never gain control over your debuggy again. So you want to set a breakpoint at the return address and you want to set a breakpoint at the next instruction in this function or the callee. Great, simple. Not really. What is the next instruction? If I am on some assembly instruction, how do I know where I'm gonna go? <laughs> set itself for breakpoints. You want to set itself for breakpoints, but you need to know where to set the breakpoints. Yeah, so you might have, um, you might just be going to the next instruction. You know, if you're doing an add, you're doing a subtract, you're doing a move, doing another move. Simple, you just set breakpoint in the next instruction. Maybe you're doing a jump. Maybe you're doing conditional jump. Maybe you have no idea what's going on. Uh, so actually answering what's the next instruction requires understanding your actual target. So in reality, um, you need to inspect the code to work out possible branch targets, set breakpoints there. What this essentially ends with is your debugger ships like a instruction emulator for your target, what LDB does. I'll talk a little bit more about how that makes a mess of some things later, but this is okay for now. Um, stepping over is very, very similar, you know, set breakpoint at return address and the next instruction in this function. We still have that same question, but the answer is the same. You know, you need to work out your branch targets. Registers in memory. This is a useful thing. If you're doing like really low level stuff, you want to be able to write your, read your registers. Reading memory is useful for a whole host of problems. So reading registers is actually way more simple than you might expect. There's just a, a ptrace call for it. So you say, um, I have this user reg struct thing which I construct and I just pass it in and I get out something like this, which just has a field for every single um, register which I might want the value of. Fairly simple. Uh, if I want to then write the registers, then I just do the read, I set some value, and then I write it back using set regs. Not that magical, eh? For reading and writing memory, 
it's the same kind of thing. I have these peak data and these poke data calls. The unfortunate thing about this, can anyone see something which, yes? It's a word from the one word per Exactly, it's a word at a time. So if you're wanting to read um, a big amount of memory, maybe I have a, um, a massive array which I want to, um, to show to the, to the user, or the user has requested, okay, I want a memory dump of like this entire bit of my program. Doing all that reading a word at a time is super inefficient because we have a syscall and we have a context switch down into kernel mode and we come back up every single word. So that's not great. So there are calls like um, process VM, read V and write, which can do um, multi-word reading and writing. So this is one case where like, you can use ptrace but you don't really want to. Stack unwinding. Um, so stack unwinding can get very complicated. There is in fact an entire talk on um, exceptions in C++ and how the stack is unwound on Windows. That's um, James' talk later today. So I'd recommend going to see this if you want a more comprehensive view. I'm gonna cover kind of the most simple case. Um, but it should give you a flavor for the kinds of things which um, will actually occur. So this is what stack could look like for x86-64, given the System5 ABI. So you have all your arguments, your return address, um, the old frame pointer, so the pointer to the previous stack frame, and then your local variables. Is everyone okay with this, any questions? Um, so we have code like this. Um, Baz calls bar, bar calls foo, foo, output high. And we want to set breakpoint here on the C out call. Then what are we in? We are in some stack frame. We don't really have any information apart from that. So if we want to show the user um, how are we actually got to this function, what functions did we call on the way, then we need to walk up the stack. And so what we can do is we can say, okay, well, we have the frame pointer for the previous stack frame, so we can just go back. Now we found another stack frame, but we have no idea what it's for. Like, we have some argument, above this return we'll have some arguments and then we'll have some um, some local variables and things like that, but we don't really know what this thing is. It's just a stack frame. So we can use the return address to look up the dwarf information. Because the dwarf information says, okay, here's the, the range that this function's code lives at. If I know my return address, I can say, okay, well, it doesn't match this function, it doesn't match this function. Here's the function we're in. We know it's between this um, low value and this high value. And that's how we can find out, okay, our last stack frame was bar. And we can then send that to the user. And then we just do the same thing again. We go back, oops, go back along the frame pointer, check the return, and we know we've done, that's called bar, called foo. And then we stop when the frame pointer is zero. I mean, in reality, above this, we'd have like main and then like underscore start, and things like that, but for sake of brevity. So this is how stack unwinding would work if you have easy access to frame pointers. Sometimes you don't. Expression evaluation. Now, you might notice as I get further into this talk, these get more and more complicated and expression evaluation certainly could be an entire hour talk on its own, multiple talks. So I'll talk about the kind of broad aspects of it. We're gonna print my integer. It's a local variable, has some value, it's on the stack, fairly easy to get hold of. So what we can do is look at our dwarf information. Dwarf information is so handy. And this tells us its name, so we find the name, we might have multiple things named in, but dwarf information, you have scopes, so you can work out which scope you're in and which is the right one. Uh, and this tells us where our variable is located. So this might be, oh, it's just in register n. 
or it could be, in this case, that it's an offset from our frame, our stack frame. This thing is stored on the stack. So we then need to go and find where our stack frame is and offset it by negative eight, and we'll find our value. And then using ptrace or the VM process read v, um, just a second, then we can go ahead and look where that address is and read the value out. Yes, question? If a variable is stored Yes, I will. Have, so the question was if something is relocated, so like if, if it starts off in register 12 and then is moved to register 17 because the allocator, register allocator decides it needs to move things around, is that um, reflected in the dwarf information? The answer is yes. Um, so there are, there are various different ways that dwarf information can um, represent addresses. And one of those is um, lists of ranges. So it can say between this PC and that, that PC, it lives here. Between this PC and that PC, it lives over there. Here it's on the stack, here it's in the register. And that can all be represented by dwarf. That's the question. Yeah. Um, and yes, yeah, so I just mentioned that there are various ways to, um, for dwarf information to represent addresses. Uh, so this becomes annoying for debuggers to handle because, you know, maybe my frame base is just in register six and I can go read that register and then I can offset it and it's all fine. Maybe I need to go look at the call frame information. This is like a section in our ELF, which um, stores information for stack unwinding for exceptions. This is like the, the real way which you could do stack unwinding in the absence of frame pointer information and things like that but it gets quite hairy, so I'm, I'm not gonna show that. And this, this example um, right at the bottom shows the ranges. I didn't really um, expect people to be able to read this, but this is just showing that there are a bunch of different ways in which it's represented, but that's how the ranges kind of look when you dump them out. Getting a little bit more complicated, we have some local variable myint and another one called a, and we want to multiply them. So we could kind of do a lot of stuff in the debugger, but what some things do, this is what LDB actually does, generates a function. So this has some special magic in it to um, say what local variables I'm using and things like that. But it generates a function, generates LLVM IR from it. You don't need to understand what this is doing, just note that it exists and this is actually what LDB really produces. Uh, and then that IOR is interpreted to get out the final result. So the debugger isn't having to implement its own C++ expression parser and evaluator. If we want to do something like call a function, maybe this function has side effects. Maybe we want the side effects to happen. Maybe it's gonna change some values or print something out and we want this to actually be um, occurring as if we'd called the function in our code. So we can't create some IR and interpret that because the side effects won't be properly represented. So instead we can compile to IR, lower to the machine code, map this code into the address space of our debuggy, and then, oh, I changed the JIT compile, but yeah. Uh, and then execute that function just by manipulating our registers. So this is how you actually end up calling functions within the address space and having all the side effects work. Um, so it's pretty interesting. There's a whole lot of research into various ways to achieve this and um, it's really cool. If you go and Google some stuff afterwards or come talk to me or some other debugger experts here, um, yes, question. Does the debugger have to know that the file that the number one will be buggy in order to correctly go to the right spot? So the question was, does the debugger need to know how the debuggy was compiled? Um, I'm trying to think if it would need to do anything to match calling conventions or ABI or anything. Um, Probably not because you, I mean, you can find the address of the functions by looking at symbol table or the dwarf information. So you know where 
um, the functions are going to live. You just need to make sure that the addresses are correct. Does that answer? Okay. Uh, there's another question here, I think. Yes, yeah, so if they, yeah, if our expression that we're um, like if if we're not calling a function here, but say this expression is instead like um, to see out this or like write into a memory address, then yes, we we have to do the same thing. Um, why do we not always do that? Uh, I think this has changed in LDB sometimes. I think it used to do more interpretation than it does now, but I'm willing to be proven wrong on that. I think maybe it now just always jits it. But yeah, I would have to check. Uh, Victor had a question. What are the functions inline? That's a very good question. Um, so dwarf information um, does give you information about inline functions, but it's a lot of the time not very useful because you know inline functions are subject to other things other than just inlining, because you have more local information. I do have an example coming right up, so uh, just a second. Yes. Um, so I think it, um, this is how it gets mapped in. I think it calls mmap essentially, and then writes into the map memory. Uh, well, it's, yeah, it, ha it has to generate a call to mmap such that, the, that you call mmap within the address space and get the address out. Uh, after that, uh, call the function which is executed inside the debugger of the right? Inside the, the functions executed inside the debuggies. Yeah. Yeah, come talk to me after. Okay. Um, oops. This is getting to the inlining. Um, how many of you have tried doing something like this? Quite a few. Did it work? No. Do you get something like this? Yeah. This happens a lot, especially with templates everywhere in C++. Uh, things get inlined. You don't have a definition for the function. So, you know, what do you call? It's not there. Pardon? <laughs> you could have called, yes. <laughs> so what you can do is just write this in um, <laughs> to see these things, this is awful. Uh, yeah, so you could just write this in some translation unit. You know, output a uh, um, actual definition for this instantiation. I have actually used this quite a lot. It's awful, but it works quite nicely. So if you want to just do if you want to be printing out a bunch of expressions um, which are requiring uh, functions of class templates, which would otherwise not have definitions outputted, then you can make sure definition is outputted somewhere, and then the debugger can call it. So this is like a hacky debugger tip. Multi-threaded applications, again, could be like an entire course. Um, so you could do, ptrace has like options which you can set. So you can say, I want to get a trap every time the clone syscall is called. And that is what happens when you um, create a new thread. And then there's some magic you can do to say, oh, was this um, sig trap from a clone call? And if it was, then you can work out what the new PID is and add it to your internal data structures and things like that. So this is like the thousand mile view of like what the setup is for dealing with multi-threaded um, applications. Shared libraries, oh sorry, Victor, yes. Yeah, that's, that's a question I didn't want to get into much. <laughs> The, the, the question was, uh, when, when you set a breakpoint, do all threads stop? Does just one thread stop? Uh, the answer is 
complicated because debuggers will have different modes which allow you to have like non-stop mode or all-stop mode and some debuggers do it better than others. Um, yeah, it's a, another big topic which I didn't quite want to cover. Yeah. Isn't it wrong to stop only one thread? Maybe, maybe not. Um, well, if you stop only one thread, then maybe your GUI can keep running. Gasper. Right, yeah, if you have a multi-threaded server and <laughs> maybe you're debugging in production. <laughs> maybe you're a terrible person. <laughs> then you could do this, yes. Uh, yeah, come talk to me after. <laughs> Don't debug in production. Okay, shared libraries. This was something which I didn't understand for the longest time because it's really badly documented until you find the header file which explains everything and it's great. But if you want to trace when shared libraries are loaded and unloaded, because maybe you, um, if you use shared libraries at all, you've probably got into the situation where you want to set a breakpoint on something in the shared library and the debugger says, oh, we couldn't find this, do you want to wait and we'll try and set it if a library turns up. This happens a lot. Um, and this is how it's implemented because it has to know when something's been loaded because maybe um, you just hit, you set a breakpoint on a function, you continue. Um, if a shared library is loaded with that function in it, you want that breakpoint to be hit rather than just waiting until the heat death of the universe or the, fun of the um, program terminates or something. So somewhere in your program, there is a way to get this somewhere. Um, there is this kind of data structure, which has a bunch of tags and information about your program. This is like dynamic process information. And one of these entries points to something like this, our debug. Now the most important things in this are this link map, which tells you every single shared library which is loaded, its name, where it's loaded. So this is the kind of thing we want to be, like it's, it's a linked list, so we want to walk the linked list and um, find what our shared libraries are. The really cool thing, at least I think it's really cool, I'm really nerdy, is this. So this is an address of a function which will get called every time a shared library is loaded or unloaded. So what can we do in order to read the link map every time? There's something our debugger can do. Set a software breakpoint. So we set a software breakpoint at this address and every time the function is called, we know that a library has been loaded or unloaded. We can then walk this link map um, see if there are any differences. I mean, there's, there's some ways for the, um, the operating system to tell if there are changes, things like that. But we can essentially walk it, update our data structure, set breakpoints, um, and this breakpoint is like hidden from the user. So the debuggers are, the debuggers are setting breakpoints all the time without you actually noticing it, but they're doing it to do things like this, trace, shared library, loading. Um, and it's all hidden. There are some ways to get the debugger to like show you these things. I think LDB has a option to print like internal breakpoints, so you can you will see things like this being set, which is pretty cool. Um, so this is kind of how it goes. The debugger sets a breakpoint, magic function. When it's hit, you walk through the link map, update data structures. Remote debugging. So this is kind of how a remote debugging session looks. You have the debugger on your host you have a debug stub on the target. Now this debug stub is supposed to be, supposed to be a very thin wrapper around the operating system debug interface like ptrace. In reality, this thing is massive. Like LDB's debug stub for x86 ships like an entire instruction emulator. <laughs> so yeah, it's not really a tiny thing anymore, which is a bit frustrating. The idea is that the debugger communicates with the debug stub. The debug stub operates with the debuggy in some OS specific manner, like ptrace. And then just everything's sent between the debugger and the debug stub. 
Now, the interesting thing is you're actually using this all the time. Because this is how debuggers, or quite a lot of debuggers operate just doing local debugging. Because it means it's a whole lot easier to implement a bunch of this stuff. Um, you just always have a debugger connecting to a debug stub. It just so happens that the debug stub is on the same machine as you're running the debugger. So this is how LDB operates all the time, for example. I think GDB does as well, but I don't know GDB as well. Yes? That's a very good question. What if debug symbols are not available? And yes, debug symbols should generally are not available in the debug stub um, because the, the debug symbols are, uh, debug information is like high level information which only the debugger has access to. The idea is that um, the debug stub should just be handling like addresses and super low level stuff. So generally the debug stub does not have access to um, the debug info. It's just the debugger works out all the addresses and sends it over the, to the debug stub. Okay. Yeah, so I'm gonna show how it sends requests just now as well. So there's a remote protocol um, called the GDB remote protocol, and that's what GDB and LLDB use. Um, so it looks kind of like this. Um, this is just it blown up a bit so I can explain all the different parts. Um, so you just have packet start, some type, which is like a little identifier, arguments, and then a checksum. So this is just sent like over a network or over any kind of communication channel. So for example, this is a debug, a breakpoint packet, which sets a breakpoint at some address, and then there's an architecture specific thing. I can't remember what that's actually used for on x86. And that's how you write, or that's how C++ debuggers work. Thank you. Okay, I have resources there if anyone would like, and I will now take questions. Yes, Gashbar. Why can't we properly debug over a fork? Why can't we properly debug over a fork? Uh, this annoys me too. Um, GDB has a very, very good, well, comparatively very good follow forks mode. LDB does not. Um, so the GDB follow forks mode is, in my experience, has mostly worked okay. So it's just a, something you can set and say, okay, when my program forks, I want to follow my child rather than the parent. Um, have you had bad experiences with that? You only want to follow both. Right, yeah. I haven't thought much about debugging both at the same time. Uh, maybe modern GDB has more support for that or something. <laughs> yeah, so the, yeah, GDB, um, just connects to the child as soon as it can rather than doing something nicer, yeah. Yeah, I know some people who have worked on follow forks mode stuff, um, but I can't remember the details. Uh, yeah, I'm not so sure about that part myself, but yeah. Um, other questions, yes, at the back. Sorry, can you come to the microphone? How do watch points work? So watch points use the hardware breakpoints because you can set them on um, reading and writing as well. So you say I want to set watch point of this variable. I know where that variable lives because I have the dwarf information, and then I can set hardware breakpoints to um, trap on reading and writing. So you can only do it on register stuff. Um, no, the registers are having addresses written into them. Um, so you're watching addresses. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, Victor? So you you have uh, a protocol between the debugger and the stub. Is, is that 
standardized or, or yes. the debugger has a different? Um, well, it's it's partially there is a like document which shows um, like all the different GDB remote packets. I think I have a link to it in my resources. Uh, in reality, um, debuggers will have their own extensions. So LLDB has its own packets which GDB doesn't support. Uh, the packet format will uh, have multiple versions. So if you're using different versions of GDB or um, your debug stub, then maybe there's a mismatch and things like that. So yeah, it's like, it's not like a standard as far as I'm aware, but it's documented at least. Or at least most of it's documented. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I think somebody over there was actually trying to ask this earlier, and maybe I just didn't understand the response. But uh, so some debuggers have like a pause button, right? How 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 are you inserting a breakpoint at wherever you happen to be at the time, rather okay. than? Yeah. So the the pause button on debuggers usually just sends like a sigint to the, the debugging process. So it's not like saying a breakpoint wherever you are, it just sends a signal and that um, will stop the process. Question about post-mortem debugging, how core dump debugging works? We don't have a process that we uh, debug. Yeah, for core dump debugging, I never looked into a whole lot. Um, I mean, my uh, kind of naive understanding is that you just have um, your core dump will have enough information um, to give you some experience and then your debugger is responsible for um, using that information as best it can to provide. You know that uh, bitrace calls are replaced by reading from core dump, right? What was that, sorry? Bitrace calls to read memory, to re registers, etc. replaced by reading information from core dump, right? Sorry, I can't hear you properly. Uh, I mean, Petrace calls. Petrace so calls, yes. Petrace calls to get registers, to get uh, memory, are uh, replaced by reading from uh, um, core dump, right? Right, yeah. I mean, as I said, I haven't looked in core dumps much, but I would guess that that's okay. what's done. My question was for the question evaluator. When you call a function and it actually raises an exception, so what happens there? So if you. If you evaluate an expression which call which um, results in an exception, uh, I guess the when you're jitting the call um, to the function, then the compiler which you're using to jit would have to um, output um, code to handle with it to deal with the exceptions. So maybe like a report back to the user that an exception was was thrown and not just end up terminating everything. Sorry, can you step closer to the microphone? So how does the debugger know whether or not the function could actually throw an exception? How does the debugger know whether it could um, throw an exception? Well, I mean, the the debugger is using like a full-on compiler. So like the LLDB calls out to Clang to um, actually compile uh, the expressions which you use. So it's it's not one of these things where it's just like a hack together um, C++ subset. It's like actually using Clang. So it has everything in Clang available. Uh, do you happen to know why um, <coughs> Linux only got um, single step support recently? Because x86 has hardware support for single step, I think, right? Sorry, can you say that again? Do you know why the Linux kernel only got um, single step support recently? Because x86, I think, has single step hardware support. Yeah, do I know why Ptrace only got single step recently? I mean, it wasn't recent, recent, this is like, uh, yeah, number of years. Um, I can't remember exactly what kernel version it changed at, and I'm not sure why it took longer. Maybe it was just Ptrace didn't have that um, the actual part available. But yeah, before then, like to do single step, um, you'd have to do something like the branch target um, binding and then setting breakpoints there. Thanks. Hi, uh, on Linux, when I'm Debugging an application that was built with Clang, sometimes I can't see the internal uh, representations of memory, but I can with GCC. Is there any way I can instruct the debugger what I'm built with so that I can give you better rich information? Sorry, can you say the first bit again? Oh, so uh, sometimes when we build an application with Clang, you can't really see the internal data, but we build it with GCC and then 
can see your strings or whatever you need. Is there any way to instruct the debugger, like, hey, I'm building this Clang, use Clang internal to represent this data? Yeah, so I mean, the, the debugger will know what you've compiled with because it will be set in the, right at the start, it showed a compilation unit and it said which um, compiler had been used. So it will have that information available to it. Um, it's just a case of what it does with that and whether it um, implements all the necessary machinery to do that. So. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, one more question. We have like seconds left. How, how do you debug when, when a variable is optimized away? When a variable is optimized away, then um, com the debugger will often just say, this has been optimized away. Right. Um, so, so, I mean, if, if, it's, if it's not there, then you, you can't visualize it. So, do you then, uh, then uh, add printf statements for that variable to not make it op uh, get optimized away? Um, yeah, you, you could, um, in your program, try and do things to stop it being optimized away, like stick it in a volatile um, or something like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.